So I'm Rachel, I'm Voldemar's wife, and I've got two children, Isabel and Abigail. Um, and if you ever get an email through and you wonder, who is that Rachel? That's me. <laughs> I am guilty as charged. Um, so today um, we're looking at the power of choice. And we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20. So you want to turn in your Bibles? Oh, it's on the screen as well. Lovely. So it says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, in our household, we seem to spend a lot of time just reminding our children of the consequences of the decisions that they make, even down to the small things like if they don't eat all of their dinner, they're going to be hungry later. If they stay up too late, then they're going to be tired tomorrow. And sometimes I need to remind myself of that one. But how often, as adults, do we think about the consequences of the decisions that we make? In Deuteronomy, it tells us to choose life. And if we do that, not only will we receive blessing, but we will live, and so will our children. Sometimes I think we don't realize that the decisions that we make today can impact not only the environments that we're in, but our families, and this can go on for generations. If we think back to Adam and Eve, we are still living in the repercussions of their decision to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're still living outside of Eden. We still have painful childbirth. We still have weeds, thorns, and thistles growing in our garden. The men still have to work hard, and the snake still wriggles on its belly. Man is still living separately from, the word, uh, from God with sin creating that barrier between us and God unless we make the decision to follow Jesus. The lives that we live today are a consequence of that decision that Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden. Now, if we look at Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 15, 4 to 5, God promises Abraham an heir who is his own flesh and blood, and he will have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Then Abraham is reminded of a covenant that God would give him the land which was um, occupied by the Canaanites at the time, and that would be given to Abraham's offspring. Abraham was 75 when he received his first promise from God that he would receive an heir. However, in the waiting, Sarah becomes frustrated. And in Genesis 16, 1 to 4, it says, Is that? Good. Um, now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, has borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. <clears throat> Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave it to her her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Now Abraham was 86 when Ishmael was born. And we can see in Genesis 16 that from the moment that Hagar conceived, the trouble began. Hagar started to despise Sarah and Sarah mistreated Hagar, so much so that Hagar fled. However, in the mess, God sees Hagar. God sees how she's been treated and cast out. He sees that she is vulnerable and pregnant with an heir of Abraham. He doesn't forget her or abandon her, but the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar and tells her to return and submit to Sarah. Hagar was also given this promise in Genesis 16, 11 to 13. You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Now, it wasn't unusual at the time for wives to use slaves to bear them an heir, but both Abraham and Sarah had doubted and lost faith in God's promise and decided to take actions in their own hands. Sarah at the time had been barren for many years. She might have questioned whether God had intended for the descendants to come from her. But in God's eyes, they were one flesh. His promise and his intent 
was that Sarah would become the mother of all nations. God reaffirms that Sarah would be the one to bear Isaac, and it is through him that the covenant would be established. However, God also reassures Abraham that Ishmael will also be fruitful, and he will be the father of 12 rulers, and he will make them into a great nation. At this point, Ishmael is 13 years old, and Abraham is 99 years old. And not long after, as God promises, Isaac is born. Ishmael is then seen mocking Isaac, resulting in Sarah casting out Hagar and and Ishmael, because she didn't want Ishmael to receive any of the inheritance. Now, interestingly, the Hebraic word that is used in the time of Noah for violence and wrongdoing is the word Hamas. This is also the word that Sarah uses to describe how she feels she's been treated since Abraham slept with Hagar, even though it was Sarah who suggested that he should take her as his wife. Hamas is also the way Ishmael's character is depicted when the angel of the law um, gave the promise to Hagar. And today, even though it's an abbreviation, we have a militant group also called Hamas. So now we've got 12 tribes, three Isaac, 12 tribes, three Ishmael. And we know from a previous message from the angel, they will live in hostility against one another. We've got one inheritance, one father who's cast out one son, two mothers, probably from different religions, and a whole load of anger and strife because of the decision not to wait for God and his plan and promises to be fulfilled. And we can see we can still see the consequences of these actions today. In the news, there's still ongoing trouble in Israel. When we choose to deviate from God's plan and take matters into our hands, we're opening ourselves to unattended consequences and spiritual warfare. When Sarah allowed Hagar to have a child with Abraham, she opened the door, probably unknowingly at the time, for the enemy to walk in for the spirit of Hamas to come into her household. We must recognize that spiritual warfare is real, and demonic forces seek to infiltrate our homes and families, and this can manifest in different ways. The enemy only has power if we give it to him, and if we're living in agreement with him. So we need to be vigilant and guard ourselves against spiritual attacks, through declaring the authority of Jesus in our lives, in our homes, and welcoming Holy Spirit in our midst. We can regularly pray, fast, cultivate a lifestyle of worship, and meditate on God's word, addressing sin quickly to prevent any strongholds from developing. We must commit ourselves and our families to God, trusting in his provision and protection in our lives. He doesn't want us to live in fear, but to remain confident in him. So I would encourage you to search your hearts this week. Are there any areas of your life that you are partnering with the enemy in? What spirits are you allowing to rule and reign in your lives, your households, or even in the church? It might be anger, rivalry, jealousy, control, manipulation, laziness. We might let money become the God that we serve. The decisions that we make today can have consequences that impact and influence our environments, not just for now, but for generations to come. Now, I'm not talking about whether you have chocolate on the top of your cappuccino, but using Dr. Google for your symptoms, that might have a profound impact on your day, your week, or your life. And we can see today where belief patterns and toxic behavior continues in generational cycles. Likewise, we can also pass down positive cycles such as traditions, values, and traits. Now, God tells us that he will show his love and righteousness to a thousand generations if we love him, follow him, and are obedient to him. It's easy to blame our behavior actions and decisions on our upbringing, generational sin and curses, but Christ has already died for all the sins that went before us, all the sins that happen now, and all the sins that will happen after us. We have been set free. Christ has redeemed us from each and every curse. 
In our household, it was jokingly called the Crocker Curse. Crocker is my mother's maiden name. The Crocker Curse was that everyone was a constant worrier, even about the tiniest of things, and where bad things were prone to happen. People in my family lost sleep because of anxiety, and it's been passed down through the generations. But I'm sorry. That is a lie. It is not what God wants for me or my family. It goes against everything that is in Scripture. Failures and sins are not inherited. They are imitated. We have a responsibility to cast off all the sin that so easily entangles us, whether that is enslaving habits such as addiction, laziness, or gambling, just to name a few. Jesus has defeated all powers of evil and darkness, and each generation will be held accountable if we repeat the sins of our ancestors. We're not automatically condemned because of what our forefathers have done, because we are free from condemnation. But we can choose whether we want to follow in the footsteps of our ancestors or in the footsteps of Christ. Now, I'm not dismissing their actions or the pain that it might have caused to those surrounding them, but God wants to bring freedom, healing, and redemption. By stating that you behave in a certain way because of generational curses, you are resisting the internal transformation of Jesus working in you. The God who flung the stars in the sky and holds the whole world in his hands has the power to break this off of you. There is no excuse to keep sinning. God has given us the tools to stop these patterns of bad decisions and has filled us with Holy Spirit to guide us. Let him be the only desire of your heart. Don't allow other worldly things to ensnare it or capture it. Choose to forgive and not let bitterness grow. Don't let your hearts become troubled or afraid, but choose to turn your hearts towards God. Surrender to him. Choose to live out of your new self, not your old, breaking off any agreements in the name of Jesus, rather than thinking you'll never be free from this. You are responsible for your own choices and the consequences of these. So let's change the narrative, replacing cycles of pain and family dysfunction with cycles of love and blessing, denying ourselves and choosing to follow Jesus in everything we do. Obey him, abide in him, trust in him. We need to align our belief system and our actions with Jesus to choose life for ourselves and our children, to love God, listen to him, and hold fast to him as instructed in Deuteronomy. We need to invite Jesus into our decision-making, even in the small things, and become more aware of the spiritual realm and what spirits we are allowing to rule and reign in our environments. We need to yield to the Father, repent where needed, and refresh ourselves daily in Holy Spirit, and keep meditating on the Word of God. Now, I feel as a church, we need to grow in discernment, being more sensitive sensitive to Holy Spirit's direction. He will show you if something is off. He will make you more aware of what is going on in the spiritual realm. He will guide you as the Father wants you uh, as to what the Father wants you to do, or why somebody might be behaving in a particular way and what to do. The Bible tells us to test the spirits, not just accept everything that is being said because we like the person. Christian sound bites might sound good, but are they all from God? The reality is, is that we are all fallible, but He is not. All truth, wisdom, and understanding comes from him. So trust him to guide your decisions. Know your Bible and let him have the reins. He is the all-knowing, all-powerful God who loves you and knows you intimately. If there are any areas of your life that are not in alignment with him, we need to cast it out. Stop doing it. If we allow a spirit to reign in one area of our lives, it won't stop there but it will spread into other areas, will become complacent and compromise our beliefs and behavior. 
Two spirits cannot rule and reign in one domain. The Bible tells us that sin shall not have any dominion over us since we've been raised with Christ. And if we resist the devil, he will flee. We have to choose if we want to live in freedom, free from oppression. For it's, from, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. God, that's God's desire for you, to live a life of freedom, not oppression. God has supreme authority over everything. We just need to ask him. You might need to get people to pray for you, to hold you accountable as you deal with some issues, but Holy Spirit, but ask Holy Spirit to guide you and to reveal to you any, of your, any area of your life that is not in alignment with him. And do it regularly to ensure that nothing has crept in and to keep your heart pure. It is our responsibility to guard our hearts and minds. We need to take responsibility for our own actions, for the choices that we make, because we are accountable for them. Jesus has all power and authority over all domains and dominions. We are co-heirs with him. We rule and reign with him. So don't forget who you are and the authority that you have. We have the power through Christ to reclaim these areas, to break bondages, to tear down ancient altars that have dictated and dominated ours and our families' lives. Claim what has been lost and what is rightfully ours. Take ownership, but remember, deciding not to act is also a choice. Complacency and ignoring issues is also allowing the enemy to rule and reign in that area as you're not bringing it under the authority of Christ. When we repent from our decisions, actions, and behavior, we are forgiven by God's grace. However, we might still need to deal with the ramifications of these in the physical realm. We might need to ask others for forgiveness, try to make amends. We might need to forgive ourselves. There might be legal consequences. It might affect our home life, our work life. But bring it all to God, because he can work all things together for the good of those that love him. It doesn't mean that everything will be hunky-dory, but he can strengthen you and help you through it, bring in healing and restoration where needed. Abraham throughout the Bible is described as a man full of faith, and he was, he was seen as righteous by God. Despite what he did with Hagar, God continued to pour out his blessing and favor on him, and he fulfilled the covenant that he made with him. The Bible doesn't state whether Abraham sought forgiveness or repentance, but he continued to live a life obedient to God. Even in the moments of doubt and testing, God did not condemn Abraham for his actions, but by his grace and mercy, he saw Abraham as righteous. And likewise, God doesn't condemn you, but he sees you as righteous. God still will use you for his kingdom purposes. He will still fulfill his promises to you, despite your mistakes or your past. But we need to repent and live in obedience to him. His plans for you are not thwarted by human imperfection because we are being perfected through Christ. In fact, God blots out your sins and doesn't remember them anymore because he has forgiven you and he is a good and loving father. Despite moments of doubt, Abraham continually returns to a posture of faith and obedience. His life is marked by a pattern of trusting God and acting on his commands, even when the fulfillment of promises seemed impossible. He grew in his faith by giving glory to God. And we need to give God the glory in all situations and circumstances. We need to fix our eyes on him. If you're in the midst of making a decision, then pray. God is all-knowing. He wants us to stay close to him, to inquire and to seek his advice so that we can grow in our relationship with him, learning what his will is so that we can glorify and magnify God in our lives. So check if the decision that you're making is in alignment with the Bible and ask for wisdom. When needed, we can ask for godly counsel. We can seek godly counsel and ask for prayer. Waiting on God is not a time for stagnation, but it's a time of preparation for what is to come. So don't give up. 
Seek God faithfully. Keep reading his word. Trust in him. Praise him. Bring your heart in alignment with him. It is in these moments that our faith is tested. It is in these moments that breakthrough happens. All things are possible with God. So I would encourage you, get your house in order. We are in the last days. Examine your hearts and your lives. Look at the choices that you are making. The Holy Spirit is not dormant, but living and active. And if we're filled with him, then we shouldn't be dormant either. In Galatians 5, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with one another, so that you are are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Those of us who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Beloved ones, keep in step with the Spirit. Our lives, our choices have the power to change the environments we are in for the glory of God. So church, it's time to arise and shine for him, to make good choices in alignment with his will. As the decisions that we made yesterday impacts today, the choices that we make today will affect our tomorrow. If we want to see change, if we want to see breakthrough, then we need to declare it today. The Bible tells us that whatever we pray for, we need to believe we've already received it. Now, that doesn't mean that you can pray for a Porsche and expect one to turn up. But if you are living in alignment with God, and if, if you... Um, yeah, if you are living in alignment with God, God's will, ask and you will receive. If you want to see those impossible prayer requests become possible, then you need to change the way you speak and behave, believing that you've already received it. That is your choice. If you want to see generation after generation of believers in your bloodline, you need to choose to invest now and believe it has already come to pass. If you want to see prophecy you've received fulfilled, you need to choose to steward it and act now in faith, not just sit on it. God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. He is looking to partner with you and use you for his kingdom purposes, for his glory, but he will only do it if we're willing. Are you going to sit back and relax, waiting for the next revival to come? Or are you going to usher it in? Your choices are powerful. So choose life.